How many of you remember Lydia Calhoun from before? Raise your hand. Several people? Good. Good. Lydia is a full-time sort of music therapist, and we're glad that she's visiting today, and we're so glad to have you. And Joy Haig is her uh, collaborator there. Thank you for coming. Uh, both of them are in the uh, medical trades, but uh, love to help to heal people with music. So that's beautiful. When I get honest, I admit I am a bundle of paradoxes. I believe and I doubt. I hope and I get discouraged. I love and I hate. I feel bad about feeling good. I feel guilty about not feeling guilty. I'm trusting and I'm suspicious. I'm honest and I still play games. Aristotle said I am a rational animal. I say I am an angel with an incredible capacity for beer. That's from the Ragamuffin Gospel by Brennan Manning. We are a bundle of paradoxes, aren't we? And that's exactly what Paul said in Romans chapter 7. He says, I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Does that describe you? It describes me. All the things that we want to do, all the noble acts that we want to carry out, there we are. And I don't like to talk about sin. You know, we have so little time together, you and I. We meet on Sabbath morning for a little while, and then sometimes if you come, we meet on Wednesday evening for a little while. And all the rest of the time, we're far distant. And I wish that I didn't have to discuss negative subjects. But you know, it's like if you plant a garden. If you plant a garden and, and you, 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 you get your, your plants to thriving, and you look down at the garden and you see a few weeds crop up. Well, you don't want to think about weeds. So you just kind of ignore them and you move on. And the next thing you know, you have some friends over and the friends look down at your garden and they say, hey, hey, you got a lot of weeds there. And you say, I don't want to talk about weeds. I don't want to think about weeds, let alone talk about them. I do not want to talk about weeds. I do not want to think about weeds. And so your friends say, okay, that's fine. And off they go. Pretty soon the weeds are getting bigger and bigger and it's really time to do something with the weeds. It's time to address the weed problem. But you know, you don't want to think about weeds, you don't want to talk about weeds, and you sure don't want to have to deal with weeds. So you don't do anything, and what happens? The weeds will take your garden. Your garden is gone. And so here we are today, and we've got to talk about sin. The Bible talks about sin, and so we need to talk about sin. Now there's a, a, a Christian tradition that there are seven deadly sins, and the seven deadly sins are pride. I'm not looking for a show of hands. Uh... Envy, still no show of hands. Anger, better not. Laziness, please don't. Greed, no. Gluttony, no. And lust, please. So those are the seven deadly sins, but I don't think that those are all the sins. And I'm not even sure it's a very good representation. I don't know how they really got those. I guess they scanned the Bible and looked. But the Bible gives us a definition of sin. We don't have to go past it. The Bible's definition of sin is sin is the transgression of the law. The problem is that the law means a lot of things in the Bible, doesn't it? There's a lot of law in the Bible. There's, there's the, the Ten Commandments. There's the 613 ordinances. There's the whole five first books of the Bible. And then there's the whole Old Testament is also referred to as the law. I'm going to suggest to you that in this context, that word law means covenant. It means covenant. I don't know if you've been married. There's a covenant that comes with marriage. And sometimes the covenant is squishy. But, you know, at the, at the wedding ceremony, the, the covenant is stated, right? Right? Will you take this person to have and to hold and all that stuff? You know, some people make up their own uh, vows, as we call them, or covenant. Some people make up their own language. And sometimes when they make up their own language, they, they make it kind of easy, don't they? They leave out the hard stuff, right? To have and hold in health and health and uh, when I want to and, uh, and for richer and richer and uh, what? 
So if you make up your own uh, vows, you can do that. But it's interesting, can you mess up your marriage while simultaneously keeping all the vows? Yeah, I think you can. There are lots of ways. We, uh, we had a time, uh, Mary Ellen and I, years ago, her father was giving Bible studies. This is before 9-11. And he was giving Bible studies to a man who had fled the Taliban in Afghanistan. And so this Afghanistani invited us over for a banquet. And his wife had prepared this huge meal. It was uh, Afghani food, and it was very good, very delicious. And, and we ate, and at the end of the meal, he belched loudly. Apparently, in his custom, wherever he was from, that belching loudly was a symbol, I really love that meal. I think there are more graceful ways to do that. But anyway, so he belched really loudly to say, I love that meal, thank you very much. I don't know that that would go over in my marriage very well. If after each meal I belched very loudly, I think that might cause some problems, right? And so sin is the transgression of the law, but it might also be sin is the transgression of the covenant or the relationship. Really, sin is the trans transgression of the relationship. And I used to say when I was younger that we have a lot of sins in our life, plural, but sin in the singular is separation from the Savior. And sin in the singular is where we take and put things that come between us and God. You know, there's an, I don't know how many of you grew up with the saying that if you go to a movie theater, you ready? The angels, your guardian angel waits outside. Have you ever heard that? How many of you heard that growing up? Yeah, that's so silly because it's not biblical, not scriptural, and it's just not true. Because your guardian angel doesn't wait outside. Your guardian angel never leaves you. The, the, God's not limited by the doors of a building. His angels are not limited by places you go. The only limit that God is, ever had is the limit he placed on himself, and that is the limit of your choice. And he talks about that in Scripture in Genesis chapter 2, verse 8. And we'll finish Paul's text in Romans. He says, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? And then he answers the question. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. Here's Genesis chapter 2 verse 8. Then the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he placed the man he had made. The Lord God made all sorts of trees grow up from the ground, trees that were beautiful and that produced delicious fruit. In the middle of the garden, he placed the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Then chapter 2, verse 15 says, The Lord God placed the man in the garden of Eden and tend, to tend and watch over it. But the Lord God warned him, You may freely eat of the fruit of every tree in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit... You are sure to die. Chapter 3, verse 1. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals in the Lord, that the Lord God had made. And one day he asked the woman, Did God really say that you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Of course we may eat the fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said, You must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious, and she wanted the wisdom it would give her, so she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it too. You know, we talked about last week that the great plan of God began with giving creatures choice, and God knew where it would lead. He was not surprised. And yet, he gave us the choice anyway. And it reminds me of a historical incident in 1940. In 1940, the Nazis had invaded Poland. They had invaded most of Europe. And it really looked as though there was nothing that could stand in their way. They were poised to invade France. And there was no power that could stand in their way. It was the consensus, certainly of the Nazis, but even of those who watched from the outside, that Europe would be under the complete dominion of the Nazis in a very short order. There was uh, Italy coming up from the south, 
and Germany coming down from the north and moving up into Russia. And it was, it was, a, it was a really fatalistic time. It was clear that Europe was going to be a Nazi uh, unified nation. And so at this time of year in 1940, uh, the, the Nazi army poised, the German army poised at the northern borders of France, ready to attack. And they conducted for months what was called the phony war. They continued to indicate they were going to come across the border. They'd fly their airplanes near the border, but they never really came across the border. They just continued to tease and tease and tease until finally they attacked. And poor France had prepared to refight World War I, and they had built up and fortified what was called the Maginot Line. They were ready for World War I to be refought, and Germany arrived with World War II instead of World War I. And with this, they had the Blitzkrieg and the aircraft, and France had no defense for it. They were overrun in a matter of weeks. It was less than two months. The, the war was essentially over. And they had a field marshal named Petain. And Petain said, all of Europe is going to be Nazi. The war is lost. We need to figure out how to make peace with the Germans. And so, if you're a student of history, you know that in July of 1940, Petain created a new government in France. And the, he agreed to allow the Germans to not occupy the northern half of France, including Paris. And he took up residence with his government in a little town called Vichy. And the Vichy France government ruled throughout the war, but they ruled under Germany. In fact, they gave Germany 300,000 French troops to use as conscript labor and to be held as hostages so that the French would obey and be in compliance to the Germans. And that gave birth to one of the most important and heroic movements in the history of, wor of the world, the French Resistance. Ordinary, normal citizens of France stood up and took their allegiance for the Free France. Now, the Free France was a government that was in exile. It was Charles de Gaulle in England. And Charles de Gaulle was in England with a little government that could do nothing because they weren't in their country. And the country was being ruled by Petain and the Germans. The people who worked for the resistance were called Free France. And they worked in secret, and they hid out, and they were killed when they were found, and they were chased down, and they were hunted, and they were hated by the Germans, but they were loved by the French people. Today, here, now, in this sinful world, the world is ruled by Satan. You read the Bible, text after text says that we live in Satan's dominion. This world, for a time, belongs to him. And we have joined the resistance. If you claim the name of Christian... If you call yourself a Christian, if you come here today and say, I am on God's side, you are a part of the resistance. And here we stand in the resistance, and we find ourselves sometimes collaborating with the enemy. And what does that make us? It makes us traitors and rebels, doesn't it? So I find myself in the position of fighting for free world fighting for the free earth, and yet fighting myself in the, in the throes of being a traitor and a rebel. Bill Hybels, the pastor of a church up north in the Midwest, had given a talk on sin, and one of his members that he knew real well came up to him, and he said, quote, All this talk about sin is making me feel really bad. I, for one, don't consider myself a sinner. So Bill said, Maybe you're not. Let me ask you a few questions. You've been married 25 years. Have you been absolutely 100% faithful to your wife the whole time? The man laughed and said, well, you know I'm in sales. I travel a lot. Okay, Bill said. When you fill out your expense account, do you ever add something that wasn't strictly business? He said, everybody does that. Okay, Bill said. And when you're out there selling your product, do you ever exaggerate? Say it will do something it won't or promise to ship it tomorrow when you know it won't go out till next Tuesday. And the guy said, that's industry standard. 
Bill looked straight at him and he said, do you realize that you've just told me that you're an adulterer, a cheater, and a liar? (laughs) The guy's eyes looked like they were going to explode and he said, those are awful words. Don't use words like that. I only said there was a little something on a side, a little this and a little that. And Bill said, friend, nothing is gained by watering this down. Just say it like it is. You're an adulterer, a cheater, and a liar. You know, this culture has made a real art of denying sin. Our culture has figured out a thousand ways to make you not responsible for your actions. Oh, you know, my son took up with, well, you know, a bad crowd. There's a Pinterest uh, pinning that says, um, my parents say I took up with a bad crowd, but truthfully, it seems like it's mostly my ideas worth carrying out. You know, take it up with a bad crowd. Oh, well, you know, it's genetic. I have a predisposition toward addiction, right? It's genetic. I was born this way. And you know what? Everybody does it, right? And, you know, these other folk do it, and they don't get in trouble. And, And this happens over here, and that happens over there. And we have a thousand ways of explaining sin that it doesn't sound like sin. We want to make it sound like a mistake. You know, people even use those words. They say, oh, well, you know, he made some mistakes early in his life. No, no, he committed some crimes early in his life. He didn't make some mistakes. He stole somebody's car. That's not a mistake. You have to go hotwire it to do that. That doesn't just, oops, I stole that car. Goodness gracious. I have clients, they made horrible mistakes. No, they didn't. They committed crimes. If we make a mistake of it, then we're denying our own sinfulness, aren't we? Oh, I made some bad choices. Yeah, 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 that's right. You're getting on to it. You made bad, really bad choices, illegal choices. You made some bad choices that wound you in jail and you don't like it. Well, I don't think you should like it. That's the whole point of jail. They all say, oh, I want to get out. Can you help me get out? And I'm well, yeah, sure I can help you get out. Wait till your sentence is done. <laughs> they'll sure enough let you out when your sentence is done, although, although they'll keep you a little longer if you're bad in there too. You know, we sin and we try to make it somebody else's fault. We sin and we try to call it something besides sin. But sin is sin, and you know what? We can't be forgiven of it if we don't own it. There's a famous fellow, and his name was, let me see if I can find it, Patterson? See if we can find it. No, I can't find it. Apparently, I can't find it. Somebody got my... Somebody got my notes out of order. It wasn't me. (laughs) George Parker was his name. Anybody know who George Parker was? George Parker was America's, arguably America's greatest ever con man. George Parker sold the Brooklyn Bridge twice a week for many years. The police were frequently called to get people, take them away from the bridge who were starting to build toll, toll booths at the entrance to the bridge because they had bought the bridge from George Parker. And they were setting up toll booths to, rec- booths to recoup their investment, you see. He also sold the Statue of Liberty, Grant's tomb, and, the, uh, and, and several museums in New York City. And he sold them all the time. He spent the rest of, much of his life in jail uh, for fraud. But he, he was a, he was a big-time con artist selling things that he had no right to sell and that he did not own. And sometimes it looks to me like we live in a world where we try to peddle off our sins on Christ without accepting ownership of them. You know, only Christ can forgive your sins, but he can only forgive the sins that you committed. He can't forgive mistakes. In fact, he says uh, in, he says in Acts chapter 17, God overlooked people's ignorance about these things in earlier times. But now he commands everyone everywhere to repent of their sins and turn to him. For he has set a day for judgment, judging the world with justice by the man he has appointed. And he proved to everyone who this was by raising him from the dead. So he says, mistakes God winks at. God is willing to overlook mistakes. But there's only one cure for sin. And the problem is, if we call them all mistakes, we never get 
absolved of our mistakes. Christ can't absorb your mistakes. He can only absorb your sins. And the question is, are we being honest with ourselves when we look in the mirror that we are sinners? Because sometimes it's really easier just to ignore the weeds. Well, I don't want to think about that. I don't want to talk about that. I certainly don't want to do anything about that. So here comes the the serpent in Eden and tells some lies. Sin is in its essence a deception. And it's a deception we often want, isn't it? And there are three things about the sin and the deception that occurred in the garden that are really important. And one of them is that they came and, and, the, and, the, and it was the serpent. The serpent came and told a story that she was willing to accept. Did you know that 90% of Americans still believe in God, heaven, and angels? 90, 90%, that's a pretty high number. I didn't expect it to be that, hum, that high. But a, a recent survey shows that 90% of Americans believe in God, heaven, and angels. A, a later survey that was done of just Christians said that 60% of Christians don't believe in a literal devil. Christians. Now, I don't know about you, but I read the Bible. Jesus believed in a literal devil. In fact, Jesus met him and talked to him. It says that Jesus did battle with his demons, with the individuals in the stories of the Bible, and also he did literal battle after his fast in the wilderness. So Jesus believed in the devil. Jesus believed in Satan, and so do I. A recent story by, I don't know if you've ever seen the, or listened to the show, This American Life with Ira Glass. Anybody ever listen to that? Good, it's on Sabbath afternoon. You shouldn't listen to it. But it comes up on, on podcasts, and you can listen to the podcasts. And a recent one was called The Devil Inside Me. And in that show, he started talking to people. It's an interview show where he gets interviews with people, and it's, it's actually a pretty interesting show. And, and he, uh, he interviews a lot of people. And in this show, he interviewed people about the voice within them that tells them to do things that they know they shouldn't do. And here's what he got answers when he started asking. One man said, I certainly know the voice you're talking about. Another says, the voice is irresistible always. I'm in the thrall of that voice. A woman said, totally out of control. It's got a life of its own and I can't tame it anymore. A woman says, and by the way, this guy's an atheist who's doing the interviews, okay? He's an atheist, uh, born a Jew, and he's an atheist, and he doesn't believe any of this stuff. And a woman says, I actually have a name for the voice. I call it Stan. Stan, isn't that interesting? One more letter, and it's, yeah. So Stan is the guy who tells me to have the extra glass of wine. Stan is the guy who tells me to smoke. A man says, I remember somehow realizing just how finely calibrated the voice was to every nuance, every part of my feelings, including the feeling that I didn't want to smoke cigarettes. And it's like, you might as well have another cigarette because this is it. At the end of the episode, the host asks someone, do you feel like the voice is is winning? And a woman replies, right now, yeah, I think I'm in some serious, serious trouble, to be honest. So people, by and large, even Christians, don't believe in the devil. But when you ask people out on the street if they have an inner voice that tells them the wrong thing to do, they say, yeah, absolutely. They'll answer the question. I do. We have a deceiver in this world. He is the king of this world. And he wants you to behave in ways that will cause you to collaborate with him, to collaborate with the enemy, and be a traitor to the resistance. You know, hard questions... Make us do crazy things. There's an old saying in the law that says, hard cases make bad law. Now you have to think about that for a minute to make any sense. Hard cases make bad law. It was expressed by Oliver Wendell Holmes when he said, great cases like hard cases make bad law, for great cases are called great not by reason of their importance, but because of some accident of immediate overwhelming interest which appeals to the feelings and distorts judgment. Right? So, how many people have ever made a mistake? Don't raise your hands, please. How many people have ever made a mistake because they got in the back seat of a car? Maybe it's a different era that did that. I don't know. 
But you know, everybody says, don't get in the back seat, right? But you get in the back seat and mistakes are made. Sins are committed, right? <laughs> she thought it was funny. <laughs> mistakes are made. Sins are committed. And, and the same is true. You know, we say, well, you know, I don't really go to nightclubs. Why not? Because your, your guardian angel is going to be with you, right? Why do you not go to nightclubs? Because in nightclubs, I drink alcohol, and it lowers my inhibitions and my good choices and my good judgment, and I'm in the position of doing stuff. Hard cases make bad law. We do things that we wouldn't otherwise do when we put ourselves in places where overwhelming emotion or overwhelming uh, chemicals will cause us to make decisions we shouldn't make. So I don't go to nightclubs. I don't go here. I don't do this. I, I mean, it's just sort of like skydiving. Isn't it really Russian roulette? I mean, it looks like a lot of fun. And I know some of you have done it, and I know that it's probably very thrilling. I'm, there are lots of things that are thrilling. I mean, taking cocaine is thrilling too. But I just don't know that I want to put myself at that risk. There are lots of chemical experiments that Dave could show us that might come out fine nine times out of ten and they might just blow up and kill us. And there are things that we must not do. There are sins that we must not embark on because the consequences are just too high. And ultimately, that is what sin is. It questions what we want and what we say we do and it takes us in a direction we do not want to go John Ortberg talks about your shadow mission. We've mentioned this once before. He says, you know, you have a mission. You say, I want to be a Christian. I want to share the gospel. I want to love my family and nurture them and care for them. I want to raise my children. I want to give them all the opportunities to go and be a part of society and a part of God's kingdom. That's your mission, right? But your shadow mission is... I want to drink beer and get a big old belly like this and put my feet up and watch football 24 hours a day, seven days a week, right? And you can do it now because, you know, you can buy those subscriptions. It'll give you football, baseball, basketball, and hockey 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I mean, there are a lot of games. There are enough games to fill all the time. And so the shadow mission is sitting with your feet up watching the game. And the question is, are you pursuing your mission, or are you pursuing your shadow mission? You know, the, 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 the oath we take when we get married has a lot of little clauses to it, but I can certainly mess up my marriage while obeying all the clauses. And the question of sin is not whether you're out there specifically violating the law, although I know you are. Don't try to hide it from God because you can't even hide it from me. The question is, the real question is, are you following God's still small voice in your life or are you a rebel and a traitor? Because I'll tell you this, if you're not a rebel and a traitor, I can't help you. But if you are a rebel and a traitor, there's been a provision made for your salvation. So let's own it today. I'm a sinner. Will you join me? Are you a sinner too? I sin, and I don't sin by mistake. I sin on purpose. If you're a sinner today, Christ has the answer. We read the text. It goes on. And it's a beautiful text. He says right here, In my mind, I really want to obey God's law. But because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. So now there is no condemnation. Amen? Amen? So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Jesus Christ. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. Now, I'm telling you, folks, we don't have to go any farther than that. That's the good news right there. But there are two kinds of grace that God offers. There's grace for the past, and there's grace for the present and future. Right now, there are people in this room who are sinning. Right now. There are people in this room who are, who are dreaming about 
the next moment, that next opportunity to sin. It may be alcohol, it may be drunkenness, it may be, uh, it may be drugs, it may be, it may be lust. It may be something else. It may be the desire to own or possess. It may be greed. It may be so many things. There are people in this room right now who are sinning. And the answer has already been given. Jesus has offered us his grace for our future. His grace for our present. And right now, I'd like for you to give me the opportunity to pray for those of you who are stuck in their life, and they keep finding themselves collaborating with the enemy. Now, friends, almost every one of you raised your hand and said you were a sinner. The only question remaining is, do you want freedom? Do you want to serve with free France? Do you want to be a victorious part of the resistance? You know, the interesting thing about free France was that when everybody thought that France was lost, Charles de Gaulle and the gang were sitting in London knowing that there was a chance because they were listening to Winston Churchill. And Winston Churchill said, we will never, never, never give up. And God will never, never, never give up on you. He's waiting for you, not tomorrow. He's waiting for you right now. I visited with a man in the hospital the other night. He had a heart attack. He thought he was going to die. And he said, as soon as I get out of here, as soon as I get out of here, I'm going to go talk to the pastor. And I said, buddy, that might be too late for you. I said, you don't have to wait and talk to the pastor. You don't have to wait and talk to some special pastor. I said, you can talk to the good pastor right now. And the question is, are you ready to open up your heart to God's bright light that's going to demonstrate your sin to you. It's the only way for him to take it away is if you admit that it's yours. You can't say it's somebody else's fault. It's your fault. Will you let me pray for you? Heavenly Father, right here in this room right now, we know that your desire is for us to be saved, that your desire is for us to be forgiven of our sins. We have sins, and we've admitted that, Maybe we have trouble admitting all of our sin, but right now, just now, we open our whole heart to you. We submit all of our sins to your cleansing. We know that this is your will. We don't have to wonder if you'll perform this miracle in our hearts, but right now, we have sins that we worry about for the future because we've committed them so often in the past, and we know that you have not abandoned us, that you will never give up. So we open our hearts to you, every window and door of our hearts, so that your light can shine to the very bottom of us. And we ask you to take away our sin as you've promised. We know that this is your promise. We know that this is your plan. We want to be right in the middle of your plan for our lives. And we want to hear your still, small voice. And we want to obey every leading that you give us. So we throw away and we cast away our own desires and our selfishness. We cast away our hatred, our greed, our pomposity and pride, and we ask you to cleanse us and make us like Jesus. We ask for this because we know that you want it too, and we ask for it in Jesus' holy name. Amen.